What do you get when you've done all this work? You did the planning, you did the, you did the maintenance, you kept the animals away, you did the pruning, you did all this stuff, and then you get to the marketing end and you say, well, now what do I do? Well, I started this uh, chestnut brokerage company in 2014. Before that, Tom and Kathy did it. And they did it for 15 years, right? 14 years. They started, they started out when they had uh, less than 1,000 nuts. And their last year, I think you had like 34,000 the last year. And they ran out of storage. Uh, it was hard to manage, and Tom says, why am I doing this? <laughs> and so I came along, and I said I'd be willing to help out, and said, so they passed the business on to me. That's how I got into it. My start, don't you love the passion Kathy had? <laughs> I read the sign outside. It said the passion for trees. I think all the speakers up here have, have a real big passion, a real large passion for chestnuts. I know I do. And I can tell you the customers, this, this really amazed me the first year I was in this. A customer would come in, a, a Southeastern European customer would come in, they'd bring their whole family with them, and I'd uh, sell them a bag of chestnuts, and they'd put the chestnuts in their hand, and they'd look at them like this. They, would, they just stared at them, like it was a newborn baby. And I just marveled at it. And it's because they grew up with chestnuts. Uh, a lot of these people immigrated here in the 80s and 90s from Southeast uh, Europe. And they had chestnut trees in their timber, in their backyard. And during the fall, during harvest, they actually canceled school so that the children could go out and gather the chestnuts. I heard that, I've heard that story multiple times. So they have a love affair with the chestnuts. They have a deep uh, appreciation for the chestnuts, and it's part of their food base, the chestnut is. They know about, I've learned more about chestnuts from them than I have any, uh, any other place. So anyhow, that's how I got started in the, the marketing end of the chestnuts. And this is not a co-op. I take all the risk. I work with uh, 63 growers now. And I got, I'm going to go through a list of rules I have, and I do all the marketing. And this, is a, this was the picture the year I took over, how young both Tom and Kathy looked. <laughs> okay, I work with 62 growers in three Midwestern states, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. Um, this, I don't think I have... I, I got one customer close to the, or one client close to the Wisconsin border, but these three states make up the, the bulk of, of my growers. And I have to say that the resources in this part of the Midwest is unprecedented. The knowledge that Tom has of all the experiences and mistakes that he's made and the, the type of uh, chestnut trees that he he grows and the resource with Mike Gold out of the University of Missouri. No other university, as Tom says, does the research on chestnuts. And what I've learned from marketing, I really think 20, 25 years from now, we're going to look back. And this is where it all started, right here in the, the part of Iowa, southeast Iowa. And from that radius, that's where the bulk of the growers is going to be. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere else. And, and please don't buy your trees out of Florida. I can tell you the customers don't like the chestnuts. I've heard it more than once. So we have everything you, you would need to learn and follow up with phone calls and how to manage your chestnut forest. Okay, the ground rules. Uh, I'll buy chestnuts from any, anywhere as long as they're in good condition. I have a rule. You can sell your own chestnuts and you can sell the remainder to me but you can't, underprice, you can't underprice me. If you do that, I don't want to buy your chestnuts because now you're competing with me and there's no sense for me to, to go that route. Uh, all chestnuts must be delivered by October 31st. We only deal in fresh chestnuts. 
I try to be sold out by the first week of November. So far in my five years, that's not been a problem. So if, if somebody is holding chestnuts, they have to keep them in a cooler or someplace where they'll maintain their quality and they can deliver them the last week of October. I have two people that do that. Uh, also, as far as I know, I haven't bought any infested weevil nuts. They're going to be a problem. I don't want to bring them into our growing area, and I certainly don't want to sell them to my customers. And so we're fortunate in that aspect. We, as far as I know, we've never sold any weevil infested nuts that people have reported back to me. That's not saying it's going to happen, but uh, if that comes up or if I see it, then that'll be something we'll have to deal with going on down the road. Okay, ha harvesting and handling. It's very important with chestnuts. They're a very unique nut. They're a water-based nut. All the other nuts are an uh, oil-based nut. Because they're water-based, they lose weight every day. Uh, I can tell you on our farm, we harvest twice a day, every day for six weeks. It's very labor intensive. We hire help to do that. I tell all the growers, you, sh you need to harvest your nuts a minimum of once a day because they will dry out. The quality deteriorates as soon as they hit the ground and you lose money because you're losing weight. As Kathy said, I'm not buying as much water as I could have the day before. So you need to harvest uh, chestnuts daily. I had send out a newsletter before the harvest with the guidelines on harvesting and handling, and one of them is as soon as you harvest the nuts, you need to wash them, uh, clean them. You can do, pretty much do that in the same step, st step, and I tell people sort off the bad nuts. We, we try to counsel people. You can float them in a five-gallon pail of water. Anything that floats to the top is no good. And I just tell them to skim all those off. <clears throat> if I, I've been doing this long enough, I can tell by looking at the chestnuts when they come in how high quality they are. And I've, I've had to uh, go back to a few of the growers and give them some guidance on what I expect when the chestnuts come in. So uh, if they help me, I help them. I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, you need, if you're going to hold the chestnuts uh, more than a couple days, you need to keep them in a cool place. You don't, I tell people you can buy an old refrigerator for $25 or less. They'll hold 200 to 250 pounds of chestnuts. And for most of that growers, that'll do them for four, uh, three or four or five days. Uh, don't, don't set them in a five-gallon pail on your front porch and let the heat beat down on them. They're going to deteriorate within a, a very short amount of time. And when they come in, they're going to be warm. Uh, I tell people not at to put in containers of more than 25 pounds because the, the bulkness of them, the ones in the bottom are going to heat up. So if you're going to keep them more than that, even if you're keeping them in refrigeration, you need to turn them over because even in refrigeration, they'll get a little bit of mold on them. Uh, another, another thing to be concerned about is you, you want to keep them away from the rodents so you don't want to leave them outside. You want to bring them inside or put them in a cooler, keep the mice out of them, keep the ground squirrels out of them, keep the coons out of them. And then I, I, I try to tell people to bring them to my processing plant as soon as you can. For some people, that's going to be every second day or every third day. For other people, it may be every two weeks, which is fine as long as they keep them in a cool place and they handle them properly. These are the never ground rules. These are the things you never want to do. Leave them on the ground more than one day. They're going to lose their color. They're going to lose weight, and the animals are going to, uh, the animals are going to bite into some of them. Uh, it's best if you don't run over them with some type of equipment because they, if you do, they'll smash them. I've seen cracked chestnuts. I've, I've seen uh, uh, ones that are discolored that have been ran over. They're low quality. I reject chestnuts like that. The first year, I, I didn't reject anything, and I took a real beating. And after that, I toughened up. I... I enforce the rules that I send out, and I just don't want to deal with low-quality chestnuts because it comes back to bite me when the customer calls me up and complains. Uh, like I said, you don't want to leave chestnuts in a warm area because they will warm up. Uh, I can tell you from first experience, the second year I harvested them, 
I lived in Des Moines at that time. My farm was 150 miles away. I left them in a five-gallon five gallon, uh, bucket for the whole week. I came back, and they were all bad. So I, I've learned all this stuff, a lot of these things from my own personal experience. You don't want to store them in a sealed bag because they have to breathe, as Kathy said. So they, ha they, they have to be a perforated bag or an open bag or an open bucket or a mesh bag. And you certainly don't want to freeze fresh chestnuts. If you freeze them, they're no good, as we just found out. I've had people bring in frozen chestnuts. Thank goodness they told me before they, they left that day, so I knew what was going on. Because the first day you freeze them, you really don't know. There, there's really no way to identify a frozen nut the first day. OK. My reputation is really important. That's why I have standards. Uh, a lot of our, almost all our customers are repeat customers. I get a lot of good feedback. I talk to people from all over the United States. I hear a lot of things about the different hybrids, about our hybrids, about bad experiences with nuts out of Kentucky that are weevil infested, uh, nuts in other parts of the country. I can tell you we have the highest valued chestnut, and I'm proud to say that is true. Uh, if people bring in a chestnuts that are cracked or haven't been floated or got dirt on them, I warn them the first time, and if they don't correct the mistake, I dock, I dock them 25 cents. If it happens again, I don't buy the chestnuts. So far, I've never had to go that far, but I have to let everybody know I have standards, and the customers set my standards because I, I have had to replace chestnuts. Okay, what I've seen, uh, I've had, I've, I've seen so many chestnuts, I can tell by just a real look, quick look where they've been and how they've harvested, how they've handled. I have an older guy about 90 years old, he brings in chestnuts. And he keeps them in his basement, and they have a real strong, uh, musty smell to them. And I told him, I says, I can't sell these chestnuts. He goes, well, no, they're good chestnuts. I said, no, I, I, if people smelled them, they, they wouldn't want to eat them. And so it, uh, that was three years ago. And so the last two years, he's brought in chestnuts that he, if you're going to store them in a basement, you need to flip them over. You need to rotate them so they, they, they don't get that musty smell. That's one thing I've seen. I've seen damaged chestnuts. I've seen uh, chestnuts that deer have eaten and got into the mix. I've seen uh, chestnuts that are immature. I've seen chestnuts that are uh, too old. I don't know if they were last year's chestnuts or what, but yeah, I, I've seen it all. Uh, on average, I pay the producers 240 to 250 a pound. And I can say from the co-ops that I know of, that's a premium for what other people are paying in their co-ops. I treat the, the producers fair. I bend over backwards. I meet them. If uh, there's one guy that uh, he picks his chest, he got a flashlight on his head, a miner's cap. He he harvests the chestnuts between one o'clock and five o'clock in the morning. And the reason he does this is because the Koreans out of the major city come out at 7.30 and they harvest the chestnuts in that orchard, it's a, it's a park. And he sells me over 5,000 pounds of chestnuts. So he wants to get the chestnuts before the locals show up. I hear a, a lot of stories, maybe not quite like that, but different takes on how people do things. So I, what I do, I um, send out a driver with a band, we pick the chestnuts up so he can get some sleep and then he goes back and harvest, starts harvesting it again. I do that with a handful of uh, the growers. Okay. The, the planting, the, the pl processing plant procedures, every grower has a number so I can identify the grower if I ever have a problem. Uh, each bag that I sell has a grower number on it. So if grower number three, I sell that to somebody in Atlanta and they say they've got a problem with the chestnuts, they're moldy or whatever, uh, I can go, I can ask them what the number on the bag is, they tell me, and then I can counsel the grower. That doesn't happen a lot, but it has happened. We sort by international sizes. Uh, 
small, medium, large, and extra large. And we have a market for every size, even the small size. I have people waiting in line to buy the small chestnuts. We, we price the medium and the large chestnut the same. The reason we do that is because we have a tremendous market for the medium-sized chestnut. And even though we have fewer of them, I don't have a problem moving them. When I first started in this business, we sold a bulk of my chestnuts to the grocers. And uh, they always wanted the mediums priced lower. Well, after doing that for one year, I realized I didn't have to do it because I was always running out of the medium-sized chestnut. So then I, I priced them the same, and they they complained, I and I heard negative feedback. They said they weren't going to pay it, but you know what? They paid it. And last year, my fifth year, I probably sell 5% of my chestnuts to the grocers, and the other 95% are to the retail customer. So I bypassed the grower because the retail customers found me, and they, they recognized we had a high-quality nut that they could – a higher quality nut they could buy from me than they could in the store. Uh, I'll give you an example. Last year, we had a tremendous harvest. A lot of the nuts were big because we had a lot of rain. And so every year, our size mix is different. I have to be really careful if I pre-sell chestnuts because I don't know from one year to the next if we're going to have a lot of large chestnuts or a lot of small chestnuts. It, it changes every year. So I don't change my prices, but I do try not to early sell a lot of chestnuts until I know what the sizes are going to come in to look like. Uh, we weigh all the chestnuts that come in. I'm going to show you a picture here pretty quick. Quick. We, um, we log all the weights of um, the growers of what the chestnuts come in. And then uh, after we sort them, we weigh them again and we pay them uh, for, for what we sorted. The reason I do it that way is because so many nuts come in. I, last year I had, in a period of four days, we had 30,000 pounds of nuts come in. It was almost unmanageable in my operation. And if I had to pre-weight them, I would have got the weights all mixed up because we worked all night for, uh, all day and all night for two days to catch up. And I know I was tired, I make mistakes, and this is a way to double check that each grower gets paid for what they bring in. We bag everything in 25 pound mesh bags, and I got a walk-in cooler. We keep our cooler 36 to 38 degrees. Almost all our chestnuts are moved within four days. It's rare I have a chestnut that's been in there for over four days. All right, this is... Uh, when we, this was the start of, of last year when we got in 10,000 pounds in two days there. This is what they come looking like. It, totes and bags. This was my sorting machine. I had a local uh, mechan uh, machinist make for me. We can sort about 250 pounds an hour. Um, our, our uh, marketing mix, our pickup is represents not quite 50% of our market. We deliver 30%, and our mail order is really grew, and it's going to continue to grow. It's 25%, and I would say three years ago, the pickups were 80%, the delivery was 20 and the mail order was pretty much non-existent. We've tapped into a big Chinese uh, immigrant market, and it is, uh, it is a major market. Uh, Chinese, they must communicate by Facebook. I get calls from all over the United States from the, the Chinese people wanting to buy the chestnuts. Uh, my goal every year is to sell out by November 1st. I don't discount. I got a waiting list. Um, so far, I haven't had a problem. I always worry at the beginning of the year if my prices are too high. Uh, but after about the first week, and the calls I get, I get more comfortable. I just don't need to discount. I, I just don't do it. If somebody buys like 800 pounds, uh, they want a price discount, I tell them I won't do it. I'll give them a free bag. But I don't want to get into the, I don't want people to think I'm a discounter. I told the, the grocers this, and I don't discount to them either. I may give them a free bag if they 
they buy a large quantity, but the price is the same. And uh, last two years ago, I got a truck driver I met that lives uh, upstate New York. He hauls uh, chestnuts back to upper New York for me. And uh, I, whatever the price I set for him, he calls me up and he said, your nuts, chestnuts are too high. They're coming out of Florida 50 cents less. I said, well, I'm not going to lower the price of my chestnuts. It is what it is. And he says, man, he says, they're beating me up. Very, two days later, Tom has got the same call. He calls me up and he says, can I get another 1,000 pounds? So I've, I've heard all the stories. Uh, I don't need to discount because I don't have to discount. I won't discount. I don't see myself discounting chestnuts in the next 10 years. Uh, right now, the, the supply of American chestnuts is the size of my thumb, and the market, market's this big. We're just in the embryo stage of this whole industry. It's fascinating. There's a lot of room to grow. One thing working in our favor is you, you can't oversaturate the chestnut market in one year. It takes eight to 10 years in order to get up to a reasonable amount of production. And so that length of ramp up keeps people out of the get rich quick scheme and it helps us develop our market as we grow slowly. We are growing at about 25% of the year, 25% a year. Uh, last year we sold 84,000 pounds. In five years, I think we'll be selling 200,000 pounds. In 10 years, I think we'll be close to a half a million. And I don't have any doubt that I can sell that many chestnuts. Uh, I just hear, I hear too many things out there. And we have a, such a good reputation. I'm thankful for Tom for getting us in the right chestnuts. People like the taste of our chestnuts. We sell a lot of chestnuts in Chicago. They could buy them out of Michigan, but they don't. I've talked to, to uh, my, uh, my big grocer out of Chicago, and he pays a premium to buy our chestnuts because he doesn't like the taste of the chestnuts that come out of Michigan. The first thing he does when I take up a, a van full of chestnuts is he gets a bag out, he tastes two or three of them, and he gives me a thumbs up, and he pays the premium and they pay me in cash. This is almost an all cash market. I, I, a few years ago, I met a Korean woman in, in the Quad Cities, Davenport, Iowa. She called me up on the phone, I give her a price, she said she wouldn't pay it. And I said, well, I'm not gonna lower my price. So we argued and finally I just hung up on her. She calls me back five minutes later, she says, I want those chestnuts. I said, well, this is the price and I'm not lowering my price. She, says, she said, fine. I said, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow. If you want the chestnuts, meet me at the Menards parking lot at 7 o'clock in the morning. And so it was pitch black. It was the middle of October. I pull in there five minutes to 7. She's already parked under a street lamp. Here we are, two strangers in the middle of the night. I, I open the my van up, I get the bag out, I open it up, I put them in my hands, I show her what she's buying under the street lamp. She shook her head. I hauled uh, 500 pounds, uh, 20 bags, I put them in her cheap Jer Cherokee. She gets out her money and she starts handing $100 bills in my hand. And I'm driving to Chicago and I'm thinking, if anybody would have seen that, they would have thought it was a drug deal going down. <laughs> She, she was a 75-year-old Korean woman with her friend who was about the same age. I mean, it, it's just remarkable but the, the love affair that people have for this. So that's, I could go on and on about the stories, but it's the pe people almost to a person are a pleasure to work with. I have very few problems. If somebody thinks I've made a mistake, I correct it, even if I don't think it's my fault because I don't want any bad press. We don't do a lot of advertising, but we do have a website, and people talk, that is my advertising. Uh, the challenges, the nut size, like I, like I said, vary year to year. Uh, a few years ago, we had a real early harvest because it was hot in August, and it caught me off guard, and I ended up holding some of those chestnuts for two weeks because uh, the buyers weren't ready for them. And then last year, we got uh, cold weather the 1st of October, and the harvest just stopped for five days. And I had people that wanted the chestnuts, and I couldn't send them to them, or they couldn't pick them up because I didn't have them. And I said, they're still on the tree, and they thought I should go to the tree, take them off so I could sell them the chestnut. And it just doesn't work that way. 
So you kind of got to dance with the music that's supplied for that season. And I've, I've learned to be uh, not overly exuberant about how things are going to play out because every year is just a little bit different. Uh, the, the, the new growers, I educate them on the handling, uh, somewhat on the, the variety they pick. I get a lot of questions about fertilization and spacing, uh, but mostly I focus on how do you handle chestnuts after you harvest them. Uh, the buyer expect expectations, uh, they want high quality. That is by far the number one thing. They've got to look fresh. I get that question all the time. They said these have to be fresh chestnuts. And a fresh chestnut to them was, is a nut that's less than a week old for most people. Uh, the size, uh, the price, and the weight. And all those things are important. I have got feedback on things that uh, weren't, like for instance, when I sell uh, a 25 pound bag of chestnuts, I put 25 and a half pounds in the bag. My grocer friend in Chicago, I, when I take him, I sell him over 5,000 pounds of chestnuts. I put 26 and a half pounds in the bag because they hold them for two weeks before, or even longer if it's toward the end of the season. And they've, uh, they, I've heard the, the feedback that in the m middle of November, the bags don't weigh 25 pounds anymore. So I started putting more weight in there because he's such a good customer and he pays a premium. Uh, so when I'm paying you 25, uh, paying you money for 25 pounds, I'm actually selling 26 and a half pounds, but I'm only getting paid for 25. So I take the risk in that, but it, but it, it works out. Uh, another issue is the post office, and I'm looking to do something different there, but all my mail orders go out through the post office right now. Reason it's a headache, <clears throat> it's because I can send out 100 boxes on Monday, and Monday is the only day I do mail orders because it's just too ma much uh, unpredictability about the post office. I can send out 100 boxes on Monday. 50 of the boxes people get on Wednesday. 40 of the boxes people get on Thursday. Six of the boxes people get on Friday. By Saturday, three other boxes show up, and somebody doesn't get a box. They get it the next Monday. And I get calls. If you order 10, 10 boxes and you get eight, they want to know where the other two is. And I said, you just need to hold on, give it another day or two. I, I get those calls all the time. And so it, it's constantly on the phone reassuring people that they're going to get their chestnuts and that if they have to wait today, are they still going to be good? And I counsel them. They're still going to be good. If they're not, we'll make it right. This is my post office guy. I work with, I give him advance notice when I'm coming in. So he's got an extra person on the, on the scale because it takes two and a half hours for me to process everything when I bring it into the post office. And he loves me because he gets brownie points for how much, um, many boxes they moved through that post office. And after the first year, he was on vacation that day. I told him I, I was going to use a different post office because I couldn't, I couldn't do it if he didn't have the help there. So now he treats me like VIP and I, I bring them when I say I, I'll bring them and everything's boxed the way they want to. And what I love about the post office, if the address isn't right, they'll tell you right at the point there. So if the box says, 635 Main Street, and there's no address for that. I go back, and the person that printed it, it should have been uh, 634. For some reason, they put 635 on there. So we make the change, and it gets to the person. Uh, this was my FedEx guy. <laughs> he, he didn't deliver chestnuts, but he came in one day and, and left some things, and he says, You're, you sell chestnuts. I said, yeah. He said, my friends in Chicago love chestnuts. And so now he's buying 30 bags of chestnuts from me uh, the middle of October every year. And those are the 30 bags he's taken with him that day. So you just, you, you never know uh, who's going to come through your front door. Uh, these are my competitors. <laughs> the Japanese beetle. And that's, that's what you want happy customers to, to observe and, and feel like. That's my wife and I. And that's it. That's, uh, I don't know what happened to the other pictures there, but that's, that's it. But anyhow, uh, it's, a, it's fun. I wouldn't do this at this stage of my life if I wasn't have fun doing it. I have a passion for it. I love marketing. I've been in it my whole life. 
I just think it's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating business, and I meet such wonderful people from all walks of life. I deal with a lot of over-the-road truck drivers that pull in at any time of the day or night, and I, I go down and meet them, and they'll buy like 10 bags of chestnuts and, and take them to their friends or take them home. Uh, I, I, just a wide circle of people. I'll tell you the best story. This happened the first year. I had this gal from, uh, she's a hun Hungarian. She called me up. She was from Waterloo. And uh, they, her and her husband wanted to come down. So I give them ad uh, my address. They call me up an hour later, or no, two hours later. They're in Muscatine, which is 30 miles away. I said, you're in the wrong town. I give them the, other, give them the address again. They call me up 20 minutes later. They're in some other town south of me. I said, you missed the turn. And uh, she, her English was really poor. And so I give her address again. She called me up a half hour later. They were on the interstate. I don't know how they missed my place. And I said, well, come back the way you came. It's 10, 10 miles exactly. I'm going to be out at the entry of the fairgrounds in my car. I'll be waving my arms when I see you. And what kind of color and kind of car do you have? And she told me. So I waited and waited and waited. And finally, this car come down over the hill. They drove on past. I got in my car. I, I rolled my window down. I was waving my arms like this and honking my horn. The car pulled over. And as soon as I looked, I knew I had the wrong car. <laughs> the, there were two women in there, about 50 years old. I said, are you the ones for the chestnuts? And they both looked at me, and one gal said, no, but I think you're the nut. <laughs> so I, I, I run into a lot of uh, creative circumstances. So that's my story. I'm open to any questions you may have. Yes. I have a, a the, the question was, do I have folks that are interested in small chestnuts? And I do. I, I have a group of people in St. Louis, that's all they want is small chestnuts. And I don't sell them to them at the beginning of the year because my price is too high. So I have enough other, enough other people I sell the small chestnuts to. And when it gets to be the 20th of October, if I've accumulated uh, extra bags of fresh chestnuts and I haven't been able to move them, I call them, I give them, that's, these are the, I correct myself, these are the only people I discount to on the small chestnut. I give them a discounted price and I deliver them to them and they're, they're, they said, why don't you drop your price early in the season? I said, because I don't have to. But they're happy to get them at the end of the season. Okay. Well, uh, these aren't pecan trees, they're chestnut trees. And you get, a, you get one tree that has, we'll say, 10 pounds of chestnuts on it. That tree will drop their harvest over 10 days. And so the chestnuts don't get their chestnut color until the last two days. If you harvest a chestnut before it's colored, people don't want to buy white, white chestnuts because that's what they'll look like. And if the, if the burrs fall on the ground, it, my, my sense is that if you leave the burr on the ground, those nuts will color up. Um, but th it's a lot of work. you got to open the burr. I, I don't recommend anybody shaking a tree unless it's the last week of harvest. And you want to get it over, and then you can shake a tree. But that's the only time I've ever shook a tree. Yep. Yeah. Well, we had, that, we had a big storm go through last year, didn't we, Tom? We had a big storm go through there, and I thought I lost two-thirds of my crop. There were burrs everywhere. And so what we did, we piled them all up. We went through them four days later. And anything, we opened the burrs. It, took a, it was very time-consuming. Anything that looked good, we, we sold. The rest of them, we, we, uh, we, we burned. Because uh, they said if they're not mature when they drop, they're never going to mature. They have to have water. with uh, welder's gloves. Anybody that knows a burr, they're pretty prickly, and I've been, I've been pricked more than once. No, but they are good for your lawnmower. They will shine up the bottom of it real well. 
It's a good way, to, good thing to do before you put it away for the for the winter. Well, we've we've uh, modified modified how we've done that. When I first started, we sent mesh bag, twenty and a half pound bags. We put in a twenty pound box, and the post office took them. We were getting shrink of anywhere from a half pound to a pound. If they were got delivered in two to three days, we were okay. But if they got lost in the post office, we were losing over a half a pound. People, people must have a scale that measures to the hundredth of a pound because they call me up and they go, these, these boxes only weigh 19.92 pounds. You know, what am I, I can't argue with them. And so I told them I'd send them uh, free chestnuts because I don't want anybody to be happy, unhappy. But two years ago, we went to a perforated uh, plastic bag. We put two 10-pound bags in a box, and our shrink problem disappeared. Plus, we put a disclaimer in there now that chestnuts do shrink, and they probably will shrink. We put 20.2 pounds in a box, and we and uh, so they, they know our intent, what our intent was. And since we went to the perforated bags, I've not had one complaint about weight. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I would say 90% uh, of the chestnuts we buy are organic. Number one, they're not certified because they haven't went through the certified pro uh, process. And we do buy excess chestnuts for the, from the organic growers. This is the deal with the organic people. They get double the price. I have no doubt they get double the price or more. But they sell it at one and two pounds per customer. My average customer buys 100 pounds or more. So you can do the math. They have to sell to 100 customers. I have to sell to one. They get double the price. But of all the time and labor and bagging that goes into that, you got to ask yourself, is it really worth it? I don't, I, I have customers, uh, they very infrequent, very, it's very infrequently, or very rare, they will ask me if they're organic. And if they do, I said, you know, I tell them most of the chestnuts are, but they're not certified. We got uh, two growers, well, we got three growers that have their own sorting machine, and so they pre-size them. Uh, one of them, I resize them when I get them because I don't think his sorting machine is the same as mine. And I pay him on what I sort. We got in an argument one year, and I explained to him that my sizing is my sizing, your sizing is your sizing, and I'm trying to be fair to everybody. But the customers know if the chestnut is not the right size. I, I I get feedback on that, and that's the reason I do that is because he was bringing in large chestnuts, and they were medium chestnuts, and they were wanting to know why they didn't get large chestnuts, and that's why I put the grower number on the bag so I can go back to the guy and correct the problem. Mike? I, I don't know, but Tom might. The question was, what, how many grams per nut for medium, large, and extra large? Uh, Medium-sized nuts are in the like five, six, seven gram range. Uh, large is eight, nine, ten, eleven grams. Uh, extra large is twelve grams or more. Uh, the smalls are usually around four grams. Okay, any other questions? I would say the number one take takeaway is to har if you're when you start harvesting chestnuts, do it every day. The second thing is put them somewhere where they're not going to dry out, either in a refrigerator or a basement or someplace out of the sun. The third thing is to bring them to the processing plant, my plant, in, in a, 
soon as you can, because like, like Kathy said, you're selling me water. I want you to sell me water because I know they're fresh. So the handling of the chestnut from the day it drops to the day you bring it to me is very important because quality is number one, because I get the feedback from the customers. Oh, well, a large, a large chestnut is probably 50 chestnuts to a pound, somewhere in that neighborhood. So if I'm paying you 250 a pound, that's each nut's worth a nickel on a large size chestnut. If you're picking up small chestnuts, um, it's, it's, they're going to be less, maybe 80 to 100 chestnuts in the small size. Okay, I have to get into this. So when Tom ran the co-op, he paid the lowest price for small chestnuts and then medium size. And smalls are very hard to pick up. Imagine looking for pennies in the grass, okay? And that's what they were worth. Whereas a larger chestnut was worth like a nickel. And you know how much easier it is to see a nickel in the grass? That's how bad it was. Roger took over and he recognized the value of the medium-sized nuts, and he knew they were hard to pick up. So he raised the price that he would pay to growers for medium-sized chestnuts to recognize the fact that he needed them, and they're hard to pick up. Yeah, I'd, I advise the growers, if you want to sell them on your own, unless you do the U-pick like Tom and Kathy do, if you sell them for less than $3 a pound, you're giving them away. I, I advise people, if somebody says that's too much, I, I, I told this, I've told this story many, many times. Take them, take them to an Asian grocery store. Take a 25-pound bag in there. Say you want $3 a pound. And the guy will shake his head. He says, I'll give you two. And you, you say, no, I'd like to have three. And the guy says, no, they're not worth it. I'll give you two. He said, thank you for your time. Put the chestnuts back in the bag. Walk out the door. Within 10 seconds, he comes out the door. And he says, okay, I'll pay you $3 a pound. I, I've, I've seen it myself. You don't need to give these things away because there's not enough chestnuts in the United States being produced here at this time and probably won't be for the next 10 years anyhow. I think I'm the only buyer in the Midwest. I mean, there's a lot of people that grow chestnuts their own and market and they're probably, I know you're successful, you wouldn't be doing it, but there's, the growers I with, work with, they don't want to do the marketing. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like the, the, the corn farmer. You can take it to the elevator. You know what you're going to get. You get paid that day, and it's simple. So uh, I'm not saying you can't market yourself. I, you're, you, you can do it yourself. A lot of people just don't want to do that. It's the easy option. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I come to Des Moines uh, at least once a week, and on my way home, I pick chestnuts up in this area to take back with me. I, I call them in advance, and we work it out so they don't have to drive down there. I, I, I go down to the middle of Missouri and, and see Mike down at the University of Missouri. I go down and pick them up. Uh, if it's a one-way trip, I charge 10 cents a pound. If it's a two-way trip, it's less. Uh, so I, I don't want to make money on the transportation, but I don't want to lose money on it either. So it works for me and works for them. I do. It's called Prairie Grove Chestnut Growers. I have business cards over here if you want to take one home with you. Uh, all my information is online. I set my prices uh, sometime during the middle of August for the, for the uh, retail customers. And I send out a newsletter to all the growers. If you want to get on my newsletter uh, list, you know, text me with that number. Don't call me. Text me uh, the number on the business card, and I'll get back to you. Yeah, I'm going to pass the torch on. It's just a matter of if I can get my grandson on board with me. Uh, he does a lot of work for me. Uh, I want to do that. It's just not working out the right time. But I see, uh, uh, unless I die tomorrow, I, I see this thing being a long-range, long-term solution to a lot of people that want to get into the chestnut business. Uh, 
by having people uh, pre-check them and discard the floaters. I, I want people to do that, and I've, I, I got a couple growers that don't like to do it, and I had to dock them last year, and I have to do it myself, and I'm getting to the volume now. I don't have time to do that. I mean, I'm working until 2 in the morning the way it is, and I, I just can't do it. And so I told them if they want me to pay them a premium price, they've got to help me out. If it works for them, it works for me if they do what I ask them to do. It's an ongoing education, and some people it takes a little longer for them to recognize uh, I have a standard and I have to abide by it. it well, the, the price has definitely went up because the longer I'm in this, I, I recognize the value we have. And I don't shrink away uh, from pricing them what I think I can get. And we are not the cheapest. We compete with people that are cheaper. We don't have a problem selling out. I probably sell more chestnuts in the country than maybe three or four other people. So we sell a lot of chestnuts. People recognize our quality, and I price them that way. And the prices to the growers have came up. The first year I started this, the grower probably, I think, I averaged right around two dollars a pound, and now they're up to two forty to two fifty. Uh, you know, I I'm in this because I love it. I, I want to make a living, but I'm not in it for the money. I'm into it because I I like the business. I wanted to make it a viable business. In order to do that, I have to make a make some income off of it. But uh, I'm into it because I just like I love the group of people I work with, and I don't need to work this hard. My wife keeps reminding me, "Why are you?" Why are you working this hard? And it's because I like doing what I do. And the day I don't like doing it, I'm going to quit doing it, or I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. Well, if you're going to start a, store them in your basement, I, I advise them to put a sheet down or put them in a, a cardboard box with something in there that will absorb some of the moisture. And every three or four days, you need to go down there with your hands and turn them over. So the ones on the bottom that might get moldy, they get air. Because if they're covered up, they're not getting enough air, like we've discussed before. Well, I, they air dry. I mean, uh, what we do, we, we wash ours in a five-gallon bucket and uh, skim off the top, and then we rinse them off again, and then we put them in totes. I, I personally put mine in dish tubs, totes in our refrigerator or in a mesh bag, one of the two. And if they're in there over three or four days, we take them out and we – recontain them again so that the they're mixed up a little bit and I haven't had a problem the the moisture is not a problem it's the airflow the you got to have a little bit of airflow Well, I can tell you the East Coast is wide open. If I had enough chestnuts, I could sell 100,000 pounds of chestnuts on the East Coast if I had them. I, I know some of the people that would buy them. I don't have that kind of volume. Uh, we have a little bit of overlap with some of the co-ops you mentioned, but not a lot. We've all developed our own customers, and our customers are loyal to us. Some of them are price choppers. I've run into that, but 
you know, 80 to 90% of the people are repeat customers because they like the, the quality and the value that I have. Uh, a lot, uh, I sell a lot of chestnuts in Chicago, probably a third to 40% of my chestnuts go in the Chicago area. So it, it, the market's wide open. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. If the, the chestnuts that come on the East Coast, uh, if I'm not sold out by the middle of uh, first November, then I have to start competing with the Italian chestnuts that come into New York. They're priced, the, a lot of the, they're priced around $2 a pound. And people on the East Coast are price conscious, even though only about two thirds of the chestnuts are edible. On the West Coast, the Chinese chestnuts are coming in. So we compete with the Chinese on the West Coast. But eventually, the, the market's all going to be the U.S. market. If we get enough chestnuts produced, I have no doubt in my mind, zero doubt, that we can knock all the imports out. I have no doubt. Mike? One of the things we're going to do, <clears throat> I have on my uh, drawing board, you've heard of the Vandalia onions. They're, uh, they're uh, patent. You've heard of the, the Wisconsin ginseng, maybe. They, they sell, the Wisconsin ginseng brings a premium versus any other ginseng in the United States. We're going to patent prairie grove chestnuts. Uh, we're, we're just not ready to do that, but we're, that's going to happen because we, we have a very unique, Chinese chestnut that people like, and we're going to patent it and sell it that way. And other people are going to have to compete with us. Uh, that's the road I see us taking. And our value is going to hold. I don't see our prices coming down anytime soon. All right, that's it. Thank you. Okay.